there exists immunities that the courts and that the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel um, have recognized in terms of presidential conduct that sort of provide a backstop. Um, so, you know, we don't need to be worried about presidents being prosecuted all over the place once they leave office. Um, and they do sort of end on the argument that, yes, okay, even if the court does want to recognize some kind of Fitzgerald style immunity here, this is just so far over the line that it's simply not within that category. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, October 28th, 2023. It's another episode of Trump Trials and Tribulations. This one was recorded live before an audience of Lawfare Material supporters on October 26th. Joining me in the virtual jungle studio were Lawfare Senior Editors Roger Parloff and Quinta Jurassic and Lawfare Fulton County correspondent and legal fellow Anna Bauer. We talked about all the pleas that have happened in Fulton County and all the pleas that are coming. We talked about whether you can take back a plea by announcing that it was extorted. We talked about the blizzard of motions to dismiss that Donald Trump has filed in the D.C. District Court. And we talked about the government's response to the claims of presidential immunity. We also took audience questions. And if you become a Lawfare Material supporter, you can ask those questions. It's the Lawfare Podcast, October 28th, Trump Trials and Tribulations, Three Pleas in a Pod. It's been a busy week of news So since we did a whole podcast about the three pleas, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the pleas that have happened, but we would be remiss if we didn't gossip about the uh, juicy subject of pleas that have not yet happened. So Anna, bring us up to date. Who has pled out of Fulton County and who are the best rumors about? (laughs) <laughs> right. So we've had Jenna Ellis, Ken Chesbro, and Sidney Powell and Scott Hall. Everyone always forgets that Scott Hall was first, uh, who have all pleaded out in Fulton County. So we started with 19 defendants and now we are down to uh, 15. Um, <laughs> that took me a little bit too long to do, um, but we're down to 15 defendants uh, and, and we expect that, you know, that number will get even smaller as we as we continue through this case. Uh, there's some new reporting from CNN that uh, there are at least six other plea deals that have been floated and that are maybe uh, still in the works or that there are talks about. Um, and interestingly, within that reporting, there are a number of folks who are mentioned that uh, have not been offered deals. So that's Eastman, that's Trump. Uh, that's Mark Meadows, um, and then that's uh, uh, Giuliani. Uh, and of course, those are the people who are the kind of top bill defendants. Um, in, in case folks don't know, uh, in RICO indictments in Georgia, it's kind of like um, a, a movie where you have your kind of cast in order of their, um, you know, kind of starring role. Uh, and, and on the Fulton County indictment, I believe that the order is Trump, Giuliani, Eastman, and then Meadows. So uh, very much the strategy that Ben and I discussed, which was Fonnie Willis is very likely uh, willing to offer offer a lot of deals to some of those lower level uh, defendants and and then would be probably very happy to uh, just whittle uh, the number of defendants down to uh, maybe those four, maybe even less than that. Uh, So uh, I think that, you know, in terms of people I'm watching right now, I'm watching Mike Roman, Uh, his team, I think, has kind of signaled that they might be interested in a deal. Um, And it sounds like from the recent reporting that that those talks are continuing. Uh, And then I'm also watching Misty Hampton. Uh, It is my understanding that, you know, it seems like maybe she would be willing to make a deal. I'm not entirely sure why one has not come together yet. 
but I, I am, I'm watching that to see what happens. And then of course, you know, there's a few other people that I think would be candidates for a deal, but I'm not entirely sure what's going on with, with those folks. So everybody just stay tuned and, and we'll see who is next in the, uh, in the pleas in Fulton County. Yeah. So I want to uh, go into some of that speculation, but before we do, I want to bring up a question from former Estonian president, Tomas Ilvis, who uh, emailed this question in, and I know it's one that's on anybody's mi- everybody's mind, which is sparked by uh, Sidney Powell's uh, announcing that the 2020 election was in fact rigged and that the plea was extorted from her. And uh, Tomas asks, what happens when someone pleads guilty and then goes back on their plea agreement? Uh, Which of course is something that Sidney Powell knows a bit about having represented Mike Flynn in doing exactly that. Um, So for, first of all, for those who, don't know the law on this. What is the law if you go into court and you go under oath and swear that uh, what you're about to say is the truth and you plead guilty and you allocute to the to the facts and then you go out and give a press conference and say, uh, actually, it was extorted from me. I didn't do any of it. It wasn't voluntary. And by the way, the election was rigged. What is the legal status of that? Uh, And secondly, what happens just as a normative matter if you do it? Well, in terms of the federal system, you you really nail the person down pretty, pretty well during the plea hearing. And, you know, they allocute and there's they sign a statement about what they're pleading to. I found it much mushier, you know, just watching what was happening in Georgia so it, it's uh, I mean, what does happen is the case is restored and you, you go to trial on the original charges. Uh, but in 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 Georgia, I, I don't know uh, what they'll do. A judge would uh, would immediately demand that the person uh, come back into court to discuss, uh, you know, what what just happened. Although, I mean, sometimes they don't. I mean, it, it's a fairly common thing for people to plead out to things and then say socially, yeah, I just did that to, you know, they had me over a barrel and um, and it wasn't true. Generally speaking, if you do not come into court and say, I want to withdraw my plea, your plea stands. And that has not there been are the case. Situa- that has not been the case in the January 6th cases. A lot of these guys have strolled out of court and said, that, no, I didn't mean that. And, you know, Judge Lambert says, oh, really? Come on back in then, because we can we restore it. We're ready to go. Because that's what happened in Flynn's case, too, initially. And yeah. then he did ask to withdraw the plea. But, you know, there are lots of cases. And one of them is Michael Cohen, by the way, who re- who just testified in the Trump civil cut case that he was lying during his plea and didn't, and this was under oath, you know, and uh, I doubt very much that they're going to haul him into court for a, um, and so some of it has something to do with how long you take to do it, right? And also, you know, how emphatically you do it, I think, but I would actually be surprised if she is hauled back into court to answer for this. That seems very strange, especially because it's this first offender status and you're getting all this uh, lenient treatment and the idea is you stay out of trouble for X amount amount of time and it goes away. And then she gets out of court just hours later and says, oh, it was all a lie. I mean, how can you go forward with it? It's It's crazy. I was just gonna say, I think it might be helpful to give more background on on. Flynn and Sidney Powell here before we jump to the Georgia case, if that's okay, Anna. So for just for listeners who may not remember, um, the reason why I think we're maybe so spun up about this, at least in part, separate from the fact that it's just an odd situation for someone to plead to something and then immediately walk out the door and, and you know, undercut what they just said. Um, so Michael Flynn, of course, Trump's former national security advisor, pleaded guilty as part of the Mueller investigation. I believe uh, two or three years later, uh, then uh, ditched his counsel 
hired Sidney Powell as his counsel, and as Ben said, went ahead and uh, filed a formal motion to withdraw his guilty plea, uh, which the judge uh, was not pleased by, I think we can say, um, and it led to some extremely contentious back and forth. You're actually skipping a step. So he he pled, and then he and Sidney Powell both made some statements out of court while his cooperation was still going on that cast doubt on it. And the judge hauled him back in uh, much the way Roger describes, although this was when the case was still pending. So uh, to answer for it, at which point he moved to withdraw it. Right. And the whole thing eventually went away only because the Justice Department uh, under Bill Barr decided to actually drop the case. Um, All of which is to say that Sidney Powell is no stranger to this kind of thing. And I do think it's worth noting that at least before she pleaded guilty, she was trumpeting her representation of Flynn in those proceedings um, and some of her filings challenging the ethics charges against her in Texas. Um, So this is something that she is uh, quite proud of or was until at least recently. And Anna, have we heard anything about this being brought to the attention of Judge McAfee? Does the DA seem concerned about this? Uh, Or is this, you know, something that the press is interested in, but the case is very much moving on? No, I haven't heard anything about that. I mean, maybe maybe it has been brought to their attention. Uh, It's unclear to me. I will say, you know, I have not, this has not been an area that I have looked into or or a piece of news that I've looked into a whole lot, but I would need to look at what exactly she said or what exactly she posted, because I'm not even really sure that there, you know, if you look at the conditions of her plea, I'm not entirely sure you know, she does have this condition where she's not supposed to talk to media um, about the case, but I don't know that there is necessary. And, and, and Jenna Ellis, they added a condition, which, which was like, you can't post on social media about the case. But I, I would need to look at exactly what Sidney Powell said to really understand whether it is something that might violate one of the conditions of her plea or kind of suggest some kind of broader um, uh, willingness to withdraw her plea agreement, Um, uh, because I'm just not sure. But I will say that I don't know that because Sidney Powell pleaded to these very specific set of facts about, you know, what she did with respect to Sullivan Strickler and in Coffee County, I don't know that her saying the 2020 election was stolen while very Sidney Powell and wrong. I I don't know that that's inconsistent with the set of facts that she pleaded to in Sol in in, uh, Fulton County, if that makes sense. So in in the you know, in a federal case, the thing that it's the extortion thing, this was extorted. I mean, you know, if you take that, you know, a a plea has to be knowing and voluntary. And if you're saying it was extorted, extorted, I, I can't imagine a federal judge that wouldn't say, oh, well, then let's come on back and, and uh, retract it and let's go forward. Trial on Monday. Right. Right. I think it's uh, I, I, I think the the claim that the plea is extorted is probably a bigger problem than the claim that the the, the underlying statements about the election. All right. So one more thing on on Fulton County before we move on. Uh, what do we know about uh, now that the decks have been cleared, assuming that they don't drag uh, Sidney Powell back for trial on Monday? What do we know about when we're going to have a trial date? Well, we don't know much. We do know that Judge McAfee has a scheduling order that is uh, that relates to the larger group of co-defendants that includes Trump and and Eastman and all the 15 others who have not pleaded out. Uh, And that uh, means that dispositive pretrial motions are due the first week of January. I believe it's January 8th, I want to say that those motions are supposed to be in. So it's possible that McAfee could just wait until all those motions come in and then, you know, set a trial trial date after that. 
he could go ahead and, and set a trial date now. But, you know, he's got a few things he needs to keep in mind in setting this date. One is that all a number of these co-defendants who are in the larger group still have removal proceedings going on in terms of their appellate litigation. So you've got Mark Meadows, David Schaefer, Sean Still, Kathy Latham and Jeffrey Clark, who have all been denied uh, removal to federal court. And, and they're now appealing to the 11th Circuit. And the 11th Circuit has said that they're going to hold oral argument on December 15th, which means that that's the earliest date of course, that uh, an 11th Circuit opinion might be handed down. I Unlikely they're going to hand it down the same day as oral arguments, so it's probably going to be a bit, little bit later. Uh, and then we have an inevitable appeal likely to the Supreme Court. Uh, so uh, Judge McAfee is going to have to decide, you know, is he going to sever those removal defendants or just wait until that litigation has been exhausted because he's raised this question before of whether, you know, if uh, on appeal, any of these defendants get removed, would that mean that the whole case gets removed? And if you went ahead and started a trial, it might uh, implicate some of the double jeopardy issues that that arise under Georgia law because jeopardy attaches when uh, the jury is sworn. So he's got to think about that. He also has to think about the March 4th trial date in the January 6th case before Judge Chutkin. Judge Chutkin has been very uh, set on, on starting in March. And I think that Judge McAfee, this very young uh, uh, state court judge, is going to be a little bit hesitant to, you know, set a, a, a sprawling RICO case for January that is expected to last five months when that might, you know, uh, carry on over into the March date and affect the date for the January 6th tri- federal case in D.C. So I, he's got a lot to think about there, and I'm, I'm really not sure what he's going to do. Um, I know Trump also has arguments that he might make about why it should be set later because he's got some civil uh, cases in January and February as well. So uh, super unclear at this point what will happen uh, in terms of a trial date. Uh, Your guess is as good as mine. And what about uh, that removal litigation? We still have uh, Mark Meadows, who has the I think we all agree the best case for removal is in front of the 11th Circuit. There are some other defendants who also have 11th Circuit appeals, and there's been no proof of life from any 11th Circuit judge, right? Well, we won't find out who the panel is until I think it's you. You typically in the 11th Circuit, it's you can call like two weeks before the oral argument date. And and then that's when you find out who is on the panel. And before that, it's not publicly available. The only sign of life we've seen from that panel of judges who is deciding the merits of Meadows case uh, is they ordered additional briefing from the Fulton County District Attorney's Office and from Meadows team on this very specific question, uh, it, it takes a little bit of explaining, but basically, you know, there's a question within the statute of whether removal applies to uh, just current federal officers or also to former federal officers as it relates to, you know, acts that they they did in the uh, scope of their office. Meadows, of course, is a former federal officer. So if the statute does not apply to former federal officers, then that kind of defeats his um, his uh, bid for removal outright. Uh, and the 11th Circuit in a different case called Pate that was just handed down a few weeks ago uh, had looked at a very similar kind of statute and asked the same question of whether that statute, which I will say is a criminal statute that uh, criminalizes retaliatory liens against uh, federal officers. And they asked kind of a very similar question of, does this statute apply to former federal officers or or just to uh, current federal officer, office holders. Uh, and the answer uh, that was a very kind of textualist answer that they gave was that no, it doesn't apply to former federal 
officers. Uh, and, and they kind of went through this very textualist analysis in which they decided, you know, that former federal officers were excluded. And, and so the 11th Circuit in Meadows case has said, how does Pate, that decision, apply to this, the decision that we're making here? So, you know, I think that the Fulton County District Attorney's Office is going to take this opportunity to, uh, again, reiterate their argument that former federal officers like Meadows uh, are not allowed to remove under the statute because the statute doesn't apply to them. And then Meadows is probably going to try to distinguish Pate on, on various grounds. So, for example, the fact that that was a criminal statute, whereas this has different kind of policy considerations because it's a removal statute. Um, so, you know, there's there's various arguments they both can make, but that's kind of all that we've seen from the 11th Circuit so far. Yeah, my guess is that Scott McAfee uh, will not set a trial date while there is removal litigation pending because you've got all this other stuff to do and there are other trials in the way. And so there's no reason to set a trial date now. If you do, then you could run into that double jeopardy problem or just have to push it off. All right, so we are going to keep an eye on Fulton County for uh, purposes of additional pleas for, but basically, uh, and for motions, but basically we are going into a little bit of a Fulton County uh, uh, suspended animation. Is that is that fair? I think that's fair, yeah. All right. However, Judge Eileen Cannon has been super busy. She finally held that Garcia hearing. Roger, uh, what what do we know about the Garcia hearing? What what happened? Well, um, she approved uh, Woodward, uh, Stanley Woodward. Uh, if you remember, the issue uh, had been um, Woodward represents Walt Nauta, one of the co-defendants. And he also represents um, or did represent a guy named Trump employee four, who has been reported to be. You said his actual name. Uh, coincidentally. Uh, uh, yeah. But it, it, I, people call him. He Yusuf. comes from the number four family. Yeah. And his his parents just named him Trump employee. It was it was really one of those fortuitous things. But his friends call him Yusel Tavares, and uh, and that's been reportedly also his name. But um, he uh, is going to testify against Nauta. And his story is sort of complicated because he was Woodward's client and uh, the government um, told uh, Woodward, we think you have a conflict representing both these guys. And he said, I don't see one. And then they put him in the grand jury and he told a story. And then they told Woodward, we're going to indict him because we have evidence that he lied. We're going to indict him for perjury. And uh, unless he changes his testimony and we think you now have a pretty clear conflict because, you know, if he changes his testimony, he'll implicate your other client. And Woodward said, no, nope, I don't see a conflict. And so then he asked for a uh, a hearing on conflicts in the, this was now in the DC, this was still in DC. This was during the investigation. So this was the DC grand jury. That judge uh, gave him a new counsel. He switched counsel. He decided I'll, I'll go with the new guy, a new woman actually. And then he did change his testimony. Anyway, so th that is one issue. Woodward used to represent him. And um, the other issue is uh, there's another witness the government says it may call that is his current client. And Woodward did not see any conflict there either. So a Garcia hearing is where uh, the judge informs the defendant of the potential conflicts and the defendant waives them so that this doesn't become a problem if he's convicted and he says, gee, I didn't have effective counsel. My con my lawyer had a conflict. And so um, th his first uh, hearing blew up when the government raised a an unexpected point. And um, anyway, uh, uh, basically, 
I don't know how much you want to go into this. There are two conflicts that are that present themselves. One is who's going to do the cross examination, because you know uh, Woodward has a, a relationship, probably knows, may know confidential information. He's not supposed to use that against his former client. If he withholds it, he sort of possibly heard it. He's not zealously representing the new guy, uh, Nauta. Uh, he, he's holding back. That's one conflict. And then the one that came up at the hearing, the first hearing was the government said, well, you know, it goes beyond cross. It's also, what are you going to do at summation? Is he going to impugn the credibility of his former client? And uh, Woodward uh, said, well, wait a minute, this is a new thing. You didn't mention it in the briefs. I think I can do that. Uh, we need a ruling, but I can't advise him before. And and Judge Cannon was very upset and called off the hearing and said she didn't think there was a conflict. Anyway, uh, after more briefing, it turns out there's a conflict and everyone sort of acknowledged it. And uh, Woodward said, uh, I will get another lawyer to do the cross. I will get another lawyer for the witness. And so, uh, and Nauta waved everything. Yeah, I understand. I understand why I wave it. So um, it's sort of solved. All right. And so where does that leave us in this case? Um, there's been uh, supposedly discovery going on, uh, but there's a whole lot of SEPA issues and Judge Cannon doesn't seem to be moving very quickly. Uh, uh, where is the larger case? She has postponed several, put off several deadlines. Trump keeps raising objections. There was a deadline. There were two deadlines this uh, month relating to SEPA Section 4, which is where the government, typically what happens is the, the government, this is, the government, remember, has turned over the classified documents that are mentioned in the indictment. That happened early. But there's some additional discovery that's classified that they think he he probably needs to have. But they are allowed to he's they're allowed to ask that that be redacted uh, because some of it's ultra secret and not all of it is necessary for either him or his defense lawyers to know. So the procedure is the government files ex party and says, here's how we'd like to redact this stuff. And what the defense lawyer does is he also ex party presents sort of a precy of his defenses, his anticipated defenses. And the judge is supposed to decide, well, are these redactions fair in light of the defenses that are being raised? Trump has prevented that from going forward. He says, Regardless of what it says in the statute, I think this should be uh, an adversarial process, not ex parte. I want to know a lot more about what they're withholding. And she, he actually did this in both cases. And Judge Shutkin said, you know, because there are a few classified documents in the D.C. case. And she said, no, the statute's clear and there's controlling D.C. circuit law. Here there isn't apparently controlling 11th Circuit uh, law. And she's taking all of this very seriously. In fact, it it, it appears that um, she's never completely resolved the question of whether De Oliveira and Nauta are going to be entitled to see the classified documents that Trump withheld, um, even though they're not charged with those documents. But she she thinks maybe they're entitled to see those too, even though they don't have clearances. The Oliveira has never had a clearance and um, there's no apparent need. But she's been withholding. She says she's going to write on that. She's going to write on the fourth uh, seep of four. Um, I think there was another conventional discovery motion. She's put those off because Trump says I can't write those until I see all the all the discovery first motions to dismiss sort of things. Um, so a lot has been put off. There's going to be a hearing November 1st, and, uh, that, and, and that's when really we might find out uh, the, uh, Trump has asked to delay the whole trial from um, May until mid-November, obviously, after the election. And uh, so we might find out uh, there or shortly thereafter what she's going to do. 
All right. So that brings us to Judge Tanya Chutkin. Quinta, this is the first week in several weeks. We are not going to be discussing Trump's motion for uh, to dismiss on the basis of presidential immunity. We will, however, be discussing the government's response to Trump's motion to dismiss on the basis of presidential immunity. There are a spree of government of, of Trump motions to dismiss this week. Walk us through what he filed in general, and uh, and then tell us about how the government responded to that one uh, particular motion that we've discussed a fair bit. Thanks, Ben. So yeah, as you say, I'm not going to go in too much depth on Trump's first uh, motion to dismiss, uh, but just as a refresher, this is a motion to dismiss the case against him on the grounds of presidential immunity, essentially uh, arguing that the existing uh, presidential immunity from civil suit uh, under Nixon versus Fitzgerald and, and Clinton v. Jones should be extended to the criminal context as well, That and that Trump's actions as described in the indictment fall into that category, and also importantly, that uh, the uh, courts should not be able to consider his motives um, in conducting that analysis. Um, so that's that's the big one. Um, we also had a flurry of other motions to dismiss on October 23rd, because that that was the deadline that Chutkin had set. Um, and it looks like they, they were deciding to file things right up to the deadline. It's pretty unusual to get a multiple motions to dismiss. Usually it tends to just be one that sets out a lot of different arguments, but Trump's team decided to do it another way. We, we've been speculating in the, the lawfare team that maybe this has to do with page limits. We're not really sure. Um, the other motion. I have seen it done both ways, by the way. Okay. It's not, it's, it's not unheard of to do it this way. So the, the other motion, so the first one uh, is a motion to dismiss on the grounds of selective and vindictive prosecution, essentially arguing that Trump is uh, the victim of a sort of a political hack job, essentially. Carissa Bernhasek, who studies uh, prosecutorial power at the University of North Carolina, um, has a useful Twitter thread on this, um, and she described it as, and I quote, quite awful. Um, just really overstating the law on the subject. It's quite difficult to get a case dismissed on these grounds that people do try. And Professor Hasek's argument is that this sort of just doesn't really come close. Um, Trump also has, uh, there are two other motions to dismiss. One is on constitutional grounds, um, including the First Amendment. Um, and the other is on statutory grounds, um, essentially arguing that the the particular statutes that are at issue here uh, don't actually fit the the conduct um, that is described in the indictment. There's definitely a bit of a spaghetti at the wall approach here, but that's sort of often what you get in a in a motion to dismiss. So I don't think that's unusual. I will say I was pretty struck by the fact that um, I believe the constitutional motion to dismiss. Um, there are big portions of it that are basically just copy pasted from the original motion to dismiss on the grounds of, of presidential immunity. Um, so make of that what you will. So then let me then turn to the uh, special counsel's response to the presidential immunity um, circling, circling back around. So Ben and I uh, were very interested to see where this went because we felt like it would say a lot about sort of how the Justice Department was thinking about the case or how the special counsel's office was thinking about the case and where the Justice Department had to kind of come down in terms of its thinking about uh, presidential power. I will say just speaking for myself, I kind of expected the special counsel to, you know, take maybe a bit of a cautious approach and say something along the lines of, you know, yes, there may exist some sort of uh, immunity on the part of former presidents for criminal prosecution for conduct that took place while they were in the presidency. But, you know, this is well, well over that line. Um, the brief actually comes out swinging and is much more aggressive. And the vast majority of the brief is is spent really digging into this argument that there is no um, criminal immunity for presidents for the, the conduct of the category that I've described. Uh, which I certainly found very striking, um, and we can we can talk more about why. 
from there, you know, like as good good litigators do, the special counsel sort of sets up a range of fallback arguments in case the courts don't buy that. Uh, one of them is essentially that, you know, there exists immunities that the courts and that the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel um, have recognized in terms of presidential conduct that sort of provide a backstop. Um, so, you know, we don't need to be worried about presidents being prosecuted all over the place once they leave office. Um, and they do sort of end on the argument that, yes, okay, even if the court does want to recognize some kind of Fitzgerald style immunity here, this is just so far over the line that it's simply not within that category. So that is a, a very, very high level overview of a lot of very complicated arguments. Uh, but I, I hope that sort of sets out the scope of what we're looking at. So a couple of uh, additional points on this. Uh, the government is very clear in this motion that it is only addressing immunity from federal prosecution, thus leaving distinct the question of for example, if Trump filed the exact same motion in Georgia in Fulton County, uh, this analysis probably doesn't apply, at least not unamended, but uh, and would have to be reformulated in terms of the supremacy clause, I suppose. So it's narrow in that sense. And then there's this weird sense in which the motion is, it reads really strong because the whole, as Quintus says, the whole body of it is there is no criminal immunity. But then you get down to the last third of it and they're like, well, of course, there are statutes that we don't, criminal statutes that we don't apply to the presidency. And it lists some of them. And then there's the clear statement rule where, you know, we don't apply any statute to the president if application, if there's no clear statement that it applies to the president and if application would impinge on presidential power. And so they kind of, you know, strip out, strip down presidential immunity and deny it exists only to build it back up and recreate it by other means. But I agree, this is a, it's a really striking motion. It is not the motion I expected them to file. And I think there's, uh, it's, it's a motion that, you know, had to have been negotiated carefully with the Office of Legal Counsel. And the fact that the Justice Department is apparently on board with it I think is a remarkable change. Uh, it's not what the what Bill Barr's Justice Department would have done, and so I I, I was very surprised by it, and actually kind of delighted by it. I think it's a it's a refreshing change for OLC to be thinking about how to pare back some of the more strident presidentialist claims that the office has made rather than thinking about how to build on them forever. All right, Roger, uh, so tell us about some of the other motions, the uh, constitutional and statutory grounds motions and also the outrageous uh, prosecutorial uh, uh, persecution motion. So the the constitutional one, I, I should say, you know, in, in, in preface, um, you know, a motion to dismiss is always hard to win in, in a criminal case. Um, you know, you assume all of the, the facts in the light most favorable to the government. And um, so usually it, it, it only succeeds if there's something wrong with the statute. The statute doesn't apply. So, you know, yes, his first one is, is about uh, First Amendment protection, but he's really you know, his premise is all all I did is uh, uh, express my First Amendment views about um, the election, my opinion that I won, um, my concerns about election integrity, and, uh, and I petitioned uh, for redress of grievances uh, by, you know, speaking to the vice president about some of these things. 
you know, obviously that isn't really the way the indictment reads. And you have to, in this circumstance, right. you have to read the indictment. Just to give, you know, one of the easier examples, the phone call to Brad Raffensperger. You know, he doesn't say, I think I won, Brad. He says, find me, uh, you know, 11,780 votes. Uh, and uh, this is very serious, Brad. You know, this could be a criminal matter for you. Uh, I would really think about this. You know, it's intimidation. It's uh, it's interference. It's uh, uh, it's threats. Uh, it's not. Uh, well, and it also it, it, it cannot be assessed without reference to intent. Right. So, you know, if you if you say it could be a criminal matter for you and you're joking and the person you say it to knows you're joking, that's not a crime. And if you mean it as a threat and it's taken as a threat, it's absolutely a crime. And you, the words alone don't answer the don't answer the question which means it can't be decided on a motion to dismiss. It can't be decided on a motion to dismiss. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, the the other theories are, are uh, you know, you, the use of lies to, well, the orchestration of the of the uh, false electors scheme and 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 so forth and so on. So it it's obviously alleged to be more than just uh, anodyne uh, First Amendment expression. One of one thing that's sort of uh, funny to me uh, about this motion, it's a 31 page motion. And, you know, it begins with a Supreme Court ruling. And, you know, in that in that situation, you sort of would like to start with a Supreme Court ruling that everyone that it resonates with everyone, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, Brown versus Board of Education or, you know, something everyone can get behind. The, the key uh, ruling for Trump, and it, it is, you know, it's the appropriate ruling for him to cite. It's United States versus Alvarez. And um, it's really the Supreme Court's saying that you have a law right to lie through your teeth. And, uh, you know, Alvarez was sort of like the George Santos of his time. He was this low level uh, public official uh, elected in California, who at a public hearing uh, talked about how he was a retired Marine and because of uh, his valor in combat, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. And it develops that he wasn't actually ever in the military forces and uh, he did not win a Congressional Medal of Honor. Uh, there were some other things that are uh, that are peripheral. They don't relate to the case. He, he also claimed to have... Uh, been a professional hockey player with the Detroit Red Wings. But anyway, at the time, there was a statute called the Stolen Valor Act that prohibited uh, lies about your military history. And in a very split decision, they did decide that they didn't want uh, the, the court, the Supreme Court did decide that they didn't want, um, you know, the government to become the arbiters of truth, the ministry of truth here. But uh, so that's that's his uh, key case, um, and, and uh, you can you can see why. It's but, fitting, yeah. But um, anyway, uh, like I say, there's there's more in there than in in the indictment than just uh, you know saying things that are false. Um, there's 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 actions, there's conduct, there's uh, intimidation, there's threats, and and there's exploiting violence. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, the exploiting the January 6th to to further the scheme involving the false electors. Maybe the most interesting constitutional issue he raises, and I think we, we mentioned this once before, it's a reading of the impeachment clause. And um, the impeachment clause, and, and he, this is, he develops into a, a form of double jeopardy clause. Uh, and he says, the clause says, this is from the impeachment clause. The party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. So, I mean, most of us would read that and say, well, that shows you that double jeopardy doesn't apply. You you could be convicted at impeachment and then you could have to face trial. But he said, ah, but it says conviction. 
the party convicted shall nevertheless. I wasn't convicted. And so without being convicted, I can't be tried. And so that is, I don't think, I mean, we haven't seen the government's response yet. I don't think that's how most people have interpreted that. Um, I think most people interpret that as saying, you know, we don't want uh, presidents to be indicted while they're in office. And, you know, if you convict him and he's thrown out of office, then you can go after him. Uh, and, and, and it doesn't really say anything about what if he's acquitted at, at impeachment and then leaves office. I, actually, actually, we do know how the government responds to that because they respond to that same argument in the uh, response to the uh, motion to dismiss on presidential immunity grounds where he makes the same argument. And he literally correctly... makes the same argument as in he cut the text is copy pasted from one of the motions to the other. <laughs> yeah. So we know how the government responds to that, which is to say they, uh, they give it the deference that it is due. They are very dismissive of it. And, you know, I've been, as has Roger been lurking around the impeachment clauses since uh, uh, the late nineties and uh, that is not a argument that uh, is reputable uh, as to the meaning of the impeachment judgment clause. Quinta, you uh, have a point about the statutory motion. Yeah, just one thing that I think is interesting to note on the motion to dismiss on statutory grounds. So uh, Trump kind of goes through all of the different statutes under which he's charged and uh, has arguments for, you know, why they don't apply in his case. The one that I found particularly interesting is his argument about the charge under uh, 18 U.S.C. 241, which is the conspiracy against rights. Um, so he argues that he was not given um, what's called fair warning. Um, that essentially he couldn't possibly have known that his conduct uh, amounted to a violation of Section 241 because the statute had never been used to prosecute such conduct before, uh, which is a very nice argument for him to make since nobody has ever tried to overturn an election uh, as a sitting president <laughs> before. Um, what's interesting about that is that uh, we've actually already seen this argument made in court um, uh, in a, a, what I believe is at least the most recent example of the Justice Department uh, securing a conviction under Section 241 in an election-related case, uh, which is the case of Douglas Mackey, who is a uh, Twitter troll who posted uh, misleading pro-Trump memes that were encouraging Clinton voters to vote by text um, uh, and who was prosecuted under Section 241 and was convicted this spring. Um, Mackey also filed a motion to dismiss, um, making the same argument that he did not have fair warning that this kind of online election disinformation uh, constituted a conspiracy against rights under the statute. Um, and the district judge in his case uh, didn't buy it and essentially said, I don't have the quote in front of me, but basically, you know, it is well established that this is a wide ranging statute that DOJ has used over the last, you know, 150 years to uh, prosecute a range of different kinds of election related crimes that have to do with uh, people's right to, to vote and to have their vote counted. So, that's just a district ruling. Uh, Mackey has said that he will be appealing. Uh, so we don't know how an appellate court might consider that. But I thought that it's just interesting to note um, that this argument has already been tried at least before one judge um, and hasn't gone particularly well. All right. We are going to go to audience questions, which are going to go particularly well. Uh, Ruth, the floor is yours. Hey, my question has to do with the defense that someone is following their lawyer's advice after they have lawyer shopped extensively. And in this case, perhaps someone who's hired the best people in the White House to be their lawyers and the best people in the Justice Department to be their lawyers, who all tell them that they have lost the election. And then they go on and find some lawyers who might be reasonably considered not the best people can they then go to court and argue effectively that all they were doing is following lawyers' advice? So let me ask you, the way you formulated the question, you don't sound all that credulous of this as a defense. Is that fair? 
Well, I, yes, I think it, it is. I mean, I think that I can understand following legal advice as a reasonable defense, but I also think you can kind of dial your advisor. You can shop extensively and get lawyers who'd probably tell you anything you want to hear. And then is that as credible a defense after you've had a shopping expedition like that? Okay, so let me, I have a couple thoughts on this and I suspect that uh, Roger and Anna and Quinta may have thoughts on it as well. So first of all, uh, the rule for legal advice, uh, a defense based on advice of counsel is a relatively restrictive one. You have to have sought lawyers advice in good faith and followed it and actually believed that you were you know, complying with the law that way. And so that would be uh, significantly undermined by if you went to multiple lawyers and did the forum shopping that you're describing. And, you know, all of the good ones told you, uh, don't do that. And one of them even said, you know, you're going to, you told one of your underlings, get a really good criminal lawyer, you're going to need one, right? I, I mean, some of this advice was extremely strong, and you followed the other one. Second thing is you can't plead an advice of counsel defense without waiving the attorney-client privilege. And that makes it very hard if you then put the lawyers on the stand and they turn out to be, you know, a bit nuts and maybe admit that they'd been drinking and, uh, you know, some other stuff. That may really affect a jury. But the, the answer to your question is if you can persuade a jury uh, that, that you did it in good faith and, and uh, you really you went to Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell because you really wanted their earnest legal advice about what, what you could do and you followed their legal advice and the jury believes that, that is potentially a basis for acquittal. Uh, if and if I sound a little bit doubtful that that is going to be uh, what a jury buys when Pat Philbin and uh, and Eric Hirschman and you know are all testifying, I and Bill Barr, who's you know pugnaciously aggressive, and will say I told him he was crazy, and you know, I, yeah, I'm a little skeptical that that's going to be a successful defense. Yeah, the government is going to uh, pursue two tracks here. It, it, it will probably argue that the defense is not available for the reasons that Ben and you, Ruth, uh, mentioned exactly, you know, that there's a lot of evidence here that, you know, he he had lawyers who told him this was illegal, the, the election was over, and he kept hunting for crazier and crazier lawyers, and that he knew Powell you know, he he told people he thought Powell was off the wall. And and of course, the others will say he should have known or did know that Giuliani had some sort of uh, maybe a substance abuse problem or what whatever was going on with him. So I think they will try to block it. Failing that, they will uh, point out all of the things that uh, the caller, uh, Ruth, I think, uh, mentioned that, you know, and and uh, and in order to help with that, they have asked that Trump be required to give notice uh, by December 18th of whether he's really invoking this defense. You know, his lawyer went on national television over and over and over and said they were. Trump went on national television once and said he was. But until they do it formally, uh, the government doesn't know. And, and they there's a ton of witnesses who invoked attorney-client privilege, maybe 22, 25. And so they want to know, if you're really saying this, then you're going to waive the privilege with respect to these issues. And we need to know so we can depose more, uh, you know, interview more witnesses. Uh, in addition, they've already mentioned that uh, the fact that, well, three of your lawyers just pleaded guilty. You know, uh, Jenna Ellis, uh, Sidney Powell, and um, Ken Chesbro. Uh, and you can't uh, use an advice of counsel defense with a criminal accomplice. Um, and so they will probably argue that that's another complication. 
All right. Uh, the next question is an Anna special from Tom. Uh, with respect to the Meadows appeal at the 11th Circuit, the court has now asked twice, September 12th and October 17th, for responsive briefs on the question, can a former federal official apply for removal? What do you think this means, reading tea leaves? So this is the issue that you uh, earlier described as the 11th Circuit's proof of life. Do you read this as signaling that they're going to say Mark Meadows loses because uh, he's not a federal official? Maybe. I, I think what it does say is that they're going to answer this question in their opinion, but I just do not know one way or the other whether they will answer in the way that they did in Pate which is to say that, you know, Mark Meadows loses because he, he's a former federal official. I think no matter what they decide, though, you know, it the answer just cannot be <laughs> that former federal officials cannot remove under the statute. Uh, I think that if they do decide on that basis, uh, Meadows' team would appeal that to the Supreme Court. And I think that the Supreme Court would reverse. And so I have to wonder if, you know, the 11th Circuit is aware of that, because I, I just think the policy arguments are so strong in, in favor of including former federal officials for removal. Um, so I think if Meadows loses at the 11th Circuit, you know, I think that it just cannot be on that basis that the 11th Circuit decides. And even if it is, it's going to uh, be it, it's something that cannot be ultimately what is decided by the Supreme Court. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's an argument. I think there's a better argument for removal than a lot of commentators do. And I think there's a good argument against removal, uh, which uh, Fonnie Willis is making. I think the argument that you can't, you're not going to remove because he's not a federal official anymore is, is, is quite ridiculous, especially because administrations do come and go. And if you imagine that like the policy goal here is to prevent state criminalization of federal policy. So, you know, you, you, you pass a Texas state law making it a federal crime not to enforce the border, you know, uh, making it a state crime not to, you know, install uh, uh, things that'll, you know, cut up migrants when they're crossing the Rio Grande, right? And then you just wait till Joe Biden is out of office to indict him. That can't abnegate a federal removal, right? And so I, I think the the idea that whatever the right answer here is, it can't be resolved on the basis of the tense of the the the, the tenure of, of the service and office at the federal level. That just has to be wrong. But you know, it's, I've gotten everything else wrong in the way the courts are deciding these removal questions. So why should I stop here? Paul, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. If Trump's principal defense strategy is to delay until after the election, that leads us to the question, will the pace of the appellate court's dispositions of interlocutory filings be expeditious, deliberate, or fluttery? For a couple of reasons, it might make sense to think about the D.C. circuit first. But maybe for extra credit, the questions could be carried down to the past of the 11th Circuit Federal or the state of Georgia appeals. It's a great question. And I think it's actually one of the key questions if you're asking, if, if the underlying goal of the, the question is to assess when these cases are actually going to trial. Look, I will say this. The 11th Circuit has moved quickly on Judge Cannon's prior transgression. It is moving at indeterminate speed on the removal questions. The DC Circuit has been lightning fast on some issues, 
particularly investigative issues related to the grand jury. It is taking its own sweet time in the Blassingham case, like a year, which is closely related to, though not part of the criminal case. The Supreme Court has not gotten involved, and so we don't know at what pace it's likely to move. I think it very much depends what panels you get, and I also think it depends on the specific posture of litigation. But um, I don't know. What do others think? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because, uh, I mean, on the one hand, you, if you can get these, theoretically, you would like to have these tried well before the elections or after and not right before. And uh, so, I mean, I don't know the degree to which the judges can take into account, gee, if he wins, he'll get rid of these. I, I, I just don't know if that's a legitimate concern for a judge to have. You know, I have it, but I, I, don't, I don't know. So I, I think it's a very good question. Quinta? Yeah, no, nothing, nothing to add other than I think the questioner is absolutely right that this is kind of the key issue and the ability to consistently run out the clock on appellate litigation is something that we've seen Trump use to great advantage time and time again um, over the course of his presidency. I mean, if you think about the litigation over the House's effort to get uh, former White House counsel Don McGahn's testimony or to get a hold of Trump's financial records. Um, it took two to three years to get that information, at which point it was basically completely overtaken by events. Um, so I do worry that we may be headed for something similar here. Something that I will add is that in Georgia, pretty much uh, all interlocutory appeals are discretionary. So uh, Judge McAfee, if he gets to where it's like really close to the election and, you know, Trump requests an interlocutory appeal, he could just say, we need to go ahead and get this done before the election. And he could just deny any requests for interlocutory appeals. And, you know, that's, again, subject to his discretion. So just something about Georgia state courts that is is a little bit different from, you know, our discussions about federal appeals um, that might uh, make a difference in terms of the Fulton County case. All right. I will also uh, just add one other thing, which is that in all of these situations, the Supreme Court's review is discretionary. And so if you imagine that a stay were put on this case or on any of these cases and the Supreme Court wanted to review it, that could take months. But if you imagine that there's no stay and the Supreme Court says, no, we're not interested, that could take hours. Um, and so the range of possibility here is, is enormous. And I think we just all have to build it into our our understanding of the possible. John, the floor is yours. The question I'll toss out is just what you think of Trump's running up uh, $15,000 on his tab in New York. Yeah, so Quinta, you've followed that more carefully than I have. What do we think of the, uh, the, the Trump tax? <laughs> yeah, well, I will say two things. Uh, the first is I would like to know how uh, Judge Engeron is calculating these increases. Is he adding five thousand dollars every time? Are we doubling every time? Uh, because if it's the latter, Trump's situation looks uh, quite different than uh, than the former. Uh, so I'll be very interested to see what happens on try three. Um, and the second point is that I am just really delighted that we finally have a way to actually measure in dollar value how much Donald Trump. You know how much how much uh, he he values being able to post online, uh, because it seems so far like he values it fifteen thousand dollars worth. I don't know if I would put that dollar value on my ability to post, but Donald Trump has the heart of a poster and he cannot be stopped. So we'll we'll see how far he takes it. There we go, John Bordeaux. The floor is yours. My question in the in the Cannon trial is: there seems to be this conflation that. 
I mean, there's a violation of the Federal Records Act of 1950, Presidential Records Act of 1978, and also Atomic Secrets of 1948. But those are two different things. One is mishandling of presidential records. The other is mishandling of classified information. And it seems like we're focused on the classified information, which seems sexier. But there are two avenues of law, and I'm not a lawyer, that seem at play here. Why are we conflating them into, let's look at the classified information? There's a complete vector of prosecution on just mishandling presidential records, in my view, again, not a lawyer. Thanks. The answer is twofold. You're, you're right. There is a, you could have prosecuted this case to some degree simply as a theft of government property. Those are much less serious offenses than the uh, than the intentional willful mishandling of classified material. So it's a question of, of what you would generally speaking, prosecutors in the absence of a plea deal will tend to prosecute the most serious felony the facts let, the facts will make out. And so if you've, you know, they've all, you know, he's also stolen the paper clips that hold the, the documents together, but they're not accusing him of that, right? They, they accuse him of the highest ladder offense. And you often do that to the exclusion of the lower level offenses. Uh, and that's what's happening here. Is that a fair summary, Roger? Yeah. And then you have to wonder, did Biden take any presidential records with him when he left and did so and so and did so and so? And, you know, uh, it gets pretty it can get pretty penny ante pretty quickly. So I think that's I, I, I agree with I think you need to take your focus on the serious stuff. Roger's addendum here is important that, you know, no one ever gets prosecuted for stealing pencils from the office, even though we all bring pens home and pads of paper and stuff. Uh, th there's some there's some de minimis appropriation of your employer's stuff that is just regarded as de minimis. And, and if it's egregious, you think about it in the civil context, like you sue to recover professional presidential records or something, but you just don't tend to waste criminal resources on, on that sort of thing. Okay. Josh asks the penultimate question or rather the penultimate questioner, does Trump's public statement that Powell was not his lawyer constitute a waiver of attorney-client privilege? And the answer to that question is no. It may constitute an admission that there was no attorney-client relationship at all, and thus there was, was never a privilege. But a waiver of the privilege assumes that there was a privilege to waive. And here I think there is a real question whether there was an attorney-client relationship between, between Sidney Powell and Donald Trump. And it may be that she was never his lawyer, in which case there was no privilege. I don't think it would constitute a waiver of the privilege. Uh, do any of you disagree with that? I would just add one thing, which is that I was reviewing some uh, documents that we had obtained uh, through open records requests. And one of them was uh, Sidney Powell's attorney from, you know, I think it was last summer, uh, had been making representations that uh, I believe it was to the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, um, and then also to the GBI that Sidney Powell was never the attorney for Trump. So it was just interesting that uh, Sidney Powell was also saying that she was never Donald Trump's attorney. But that's all I have to add. Yeah, just advice to all of you, free legal advice here from a non-lawyer who's not licensed to give you legal advice. When you want to have a lawyer, have a retainer agreement that specifies that, you know, Anna is my lawyer for this matter. And if you're that way, we all know when we all get prosecuted later, uh, what she was and was not my attorney for. And that's why we always do it that way. All right. Uh, the last two questions are both from Nathan Aaron. The floor is yours. First, uh, many thanks to everyone for your uh, thoroughly enjoyable 
if not equally bizarre answers last week to my question, what historical or fictional leader reminds you of Trump more than anyone, yet, anyone else? Uh, uh, thank you. Come on. I get points for the alien, right? Oh, <laughs> uh, that was, that was, I mean, that that was, was great. That was, yeah. that was, that was awesome. Uh, uh, but was in my view, <laughs> in my view, I'll just add, uh, Trump will ring in people's minds at some point far off into the future, not too differently than Nero has over the past two millennia, including for the framers. And well, that's, uh, so that's, wait, 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 wait. I want to yeah, yeah. make a point about this, which is that the estimable uh, former president, uh, uh, Elvis, wrote to me immediately after us uh, after that and said, you all got it wrong. The answer is Nero. So you are <laughs> with the great Thomas Hendrick Elvis on this point. I just want to give you the same response I gave Thomas on that, which uh, is Nero at least knew how to play the violin. And, uh, you know, he was apparently a decent musician. What's Trump's skill? What's Trump doing while Rome burns? He's not fiddling. He's not playing the liar. So I just think it's selling Nero a little short. <laughs> Okay, fair point. And then uh, to my question today to everybody, please. Uh, do you see a method for the Republic uh, to come to some terms with Donald Trump such that he can mostly, at least, come clean and save face legally, politically, and psychologically? That's perhaps the only way we can, can collectively move on finally from him and short of the termination of his bodily existence. All right, we're gonna take that in order. Roger, what's your answer to this question? No, I don't see one short of that last option. And I'm not recommending that anyone act on that last option. I'm just saying no. I don't I don't see anything other than that. Quinta? I mean, look, the question of what justice means is a very complicated one. I think that criminal sentence is a very inadequate shorthand, but in this instance, maybe as good as we're going to get. Anna? And Nathan, you were just bringing the hard hitting questions every week. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's hard for the Republic to come to some terms with Donald Trump when he doesn't want to come to terms with the Republic, it seems. So I, I just think that insofar as, you know, I think Quint is right that this is a situation in which, you know, it's very difficult to say what uh, any kind of justice would mean, or, or at least what any kind of restorative justice would mean. Um, and so it, it may end up being that a criminal sentence is, is the most that we get. I will just say I very deeply don't believe in justice. I believe in protection of society and of the maximum good that a justice system can deliver in the realm of societal protection. Now, that often... Uh, means in car it often maps onto a kind of retributive justice model, um, but I believe in it for very different reasons than people believe in justice qua justice. And it often leads me to believe that incarceration is, you know, not useful and that people have co and useful contributions to make. Uh, in a case like this, I don't give a rat's ass about justice. I care only about the protection of democratic society and governance. And for that purpose, I think incarceration is a very useful tool. And I believe in the neutralization of threats using the criminal justice system. And if we get something that looks like justice along the way to that, uh, I guess, mazel tov to us. And if we don't, uh, I'm perfectly happy with this satisfaction of immediate needs of a, a functional needs of a democratic society, which is to deter 
other people from thinking they can do the sorts of things that he tried to do. And perhaps more importantly than that, to deter people from thinking they should try to help him or help somebody like that. And so I'm kind of bloodless about this, to be honest. We are going to leave it on that bloodless note. You are all great Americans, and we will see you next week. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution, our audio engineer. This episode is the intrepid Anna Hickey. Folks, you hear the two-tiered society here. You hear that there are listeners and there are participants, that the participants get to ask questions. They get to be part of the conversation. You too can become one of those people, become a material supporter of Lawfare and join us for future episodes of Trump Trials and Tribulations. You can do that at lawfaremedia.org slash support. The Lawfare podcast is edited by the one, the only Jen Patya Howell. Our music that you're listening to right now is performed by Sophia Yan. And as always, thanks for listening.